I know that pretty much everybody that subscribes is well familiar with how to use a voltmeter and they certainly own a voltmeter. I know maybe 30% of you have some type of scan tools, but only maybe less than 10% of you, certainly less than 5% of you, I think, actually have an oscilloscope. So if I were to make the videos with oscilloscopes, I think I'd just lose a lot of the people that, that just don't have them. But um, anyway, you can see that we can use a DVOM just fine for this measurement. Not as easy to read as the scan tool or with an oscilloscope, but it does work just fine. For you guys that hung around, see... Isn't it fun to learn things? And all that time and investment that you spent in these last few minutes here, uh, hopefully this is sinking in with you and you understand it now. Aren't you glad you didn't give up and just go and change your throttle position sensor and miss all of this? Well, there's a lot of other people that would agree with you on that, but 98% of people um, turned off this channel as soon as I said the word learn. But uh, there is actually a, a much bigger reward for you guys, uh, both the new people that may be on here for the first time and for if you learned for the first time about a potentiometer and the throttle position sensor, how to test it and everything. If you just learned for the first time that material and you understand it and you feel comfortable with it, well, I got really good news for you. The dividends pay off in the hundreds of percent because you now know exactly how to test and diagnose more than half of the engine control sensors in your car. Why? Because most of the sensors work on that variable resistance principle they are not all potentiometers where there is some type of lever or something that moves. Another example of a potentiometer would be your uh, fuel gauge sending unit. It's a potentiometer. It works the same way. Instead of there being uh, a turning of the throttle, basically the level of fuel will move the lever to adjust the resistance, to adjust the voltage to the gauge. Um, some types of mass airflow sensors, uh, they're kind of outdated now, but they're called vane type sensors. The same thing. The vane type sensor is going to be a little lever here that when air pushes the sensor, the more it pushes the sensor, the more it varies the voltage accordingly, and the PCM knows how much airflow there was based on the movement. So there's all kinds of things like that. The same principle is used in other variable resistors, such as the thermistor, uh, which is the same principle except the variance in resistance is based on changes in temperature. Your coolant temperature switch is a very good example of a thermistor, but it is the same principle. If you have never tested a coolant temperature sensor in your life before, you know how to do it now because it is going to be the same principle as what we just did. So the challenges don't become how does it work and what do I test and things like that. The challenges become what are the accepted values in a normal condition um, and are they proportional to variables that you set. And then also the other challenge would be what does the PCM ultimately do with that information. Does it adjust the injector pulse length? Does it turn on some solenoid somewhere? Does it go into open or closed loop? Um, various things that you need to know what the PCM does because if you get a code for this sensor, but you determine that sensor is not at fault and you determine that the wiring is not at fault, then most likely what has happened is the PCM is mistakenly blaming that sensor because other things, like I said earlier, nothing is an island. It is connected with other sensors. So um, you'll, it gets a little bit involved and that's going to be the reason why to really, really be an expert on the particular um, thing we're studying today, the throttle position sensor, you technically have to be familiar with the other air fuel induction components as well, because it is possible that you may get a referenced code if one of those components fails, but somehow the PCM blames the throttle position sensor.
All right, so that said, I still always invariably get emails from people that say, hey, I had a P0122 code. Uh, does that mean that I need to change my throttle position sensor? Well, now you see why my reaction is that you're an idiot because I just showed you how to test it. I do not know if you need a throttle position sensor. Nobody knows if you need a throttle position sensor. Nobody in the universe, not even the GM engineers, know if you need a throttle position sensor because the first thing I would do is ask you, I don't know, did you do the tests and did you find a direct correlation between your variance in voltage with the variance in throttle position? And then of course, if the person says no, how would I do that? then I want to go and punch them in the throat. But some of you guys will be the mutatis mutandis of that, or vice versa, in which case you are not only fully cognizant of all this, but it's actually creating more questions for you. And if you are particularly perceptive and you've paid attention to some of the previous videos, some of you who are really perceptive, and I am always, always conscientious of you guys, are noticing something. And that is that in my earlier video, just before this one, I talked about the manifold absolute pressure sensor or the MAP, which its purpose is to estimate the amount of airflow in the engine, which it does through the measurement of pressure. In a previous couple of videos, both in the uh, fuel trims video and in uh, also a lot in the intake air temperature sensor diagnosis video, I talked about the mass airflow sensor or the MAF, which also detects the amount of airflow coming into the engine. And of course, the whole point is for everything uh, to make it possible for the computer to get that 14.7 to 1 stoichiometric ratio. And today, we are talking about, we'll put it in green because it's special right now, the throttle position sensor, which is used by the PCM to help determine the amount of airflow that must be coming into the engine in order to maintain that stoichiometric ratio. Why do we need all of these? And especially if you really think about it, why do we need the TPS? So in other words, it should be entirely possible that if we have a mass airflow sensor and we know how much air is coming to the engine, do you see that it is not necessary really to know your throttle position because if the throttle is closed, then we are going to severely limit flow past the MAF. And if the throttle is open, then we are, of course, of course, going to greatly increase flow past the MAF. So why do we need to know the position of the throttle to do that calculation? And technically, actually, you don't. As a matter of fact, also combined with the MAP sensor as well, you really don't. But also, if you think about it, the reverse is true. <clears throat> Given the fact that we know the temperature of the air, and given that if we had a MAP sensor, the barometric pressure, we would be able to determine density of the air, and also given the fact that we know the vehicle speed, or how much air would be coming through the throttle, and that we know the diameter of that throttle, do you see that it is possible that we could make a formula where we would be able to very accurately determine how much air must be coming into the engine just based on only the throttle position sensor signal and maybe a couple of other things, but we wouldn't need the MAF sensor. It could be very accurately estimated given that we know some of these other parameters. So the question is, why do we need these and what do they contribute? So there's a couple of answers to that question. And the first answer, let's put a little hot wire there on the math. We'll talk about the math in another video. But uh, the, answer, the first answer to the question, and the most important one, is it is used to validate the other sensors. If we only had one point of reference for measuring the incoming air, 
there would be no possible way that the PCM would know that there is a fault with that sensor. So in other words, do you see that if we had the throttle position sensor shorted out, for example, uh, let's say that we had um, some problem where the uh, power wire and the signal wire shorted out. So there is always five volts to the PCM through the signal wire even if the throttle is completely closed. Do you see where that would be a problem? Because the amount of air coming in past the MAF is very minimal. The amount of air in the engine is going to be very, very minimal. We're going to have high vacuum because we're at idle. So that's going to be very minimal. But the PCM is seeing that that throttle is wide open. So it's saying, wait a minute, how is that possible? If we have a very low MAF signal and a very low MAP, then how is it possible that we have a fully open throttle? So either the throttle is actually not open and the TPS is giving wrong information, or both the MAP and the MAF are wrong in the same way because they are congruent in their feedback to the engine conditions. So you can you see that depending on the programming for the computer, it would look at the map and math and say, well, both these agree with each other and neither of their data is congruent with this. So we're going to throw a TPS code. And do you see where that would happen? You cannot do that unless you have a baseline reference to compare to. So that's your first reason. The second reason is because you will get a dramatic improvement in engine responsiveness. So if you think about it, when you change your throttle position for whatever reason, maybe even to closed or whatever direction it is, that that is going to be the first response, I guess you can call it, in the engine is the throttle position sensor. Do you see that when you open the throttle, it takes a moment for that air to then enter in and affect your map and also be affected by the map. The throttle will open first before either of the other sensors get any indication. So it's called anticipation. And basically the change in the throttle position is going to cue the injector pulse length to adjust to maintain that 14.7 to 1 ratio in advance in anticipation of the change in the air coming in later. So one of the things is this is actually evidenced by the fact that one of those things we were looking for with a bad throttle position sensor is the dead spot. If you're on your throttle position sensor and you have a dead spot right there, well remember at that dead spot you are not actually off the gas pedal. Your throttle position is still open at that point, which means your MAP signal is still increasing and your MAF signal is still increasing. But at that dead spot, what happens? You will get a hiccup in the car. You'll get a hesitation because the throttle position sensor reading there, even though the MAF and MAP are still calling for the continued addition of fuel, that dead spot there is going to be the primary reaction from the PCM to decrease the fuel addition. And of course, at that moment, you're going to run very lean, even though the throttle is still open and it's indicated by your map and math sensors. All right. So, you know what? Um, I think what we're going to do, if you guys want to hang on just for a little bit longer, um, who's in the mood for doing something stupid? So what we're going to do is I wanted to go back to the first reason, and that is the validation, because I think it's, it's very important if you want to reach a really high level of diagnostic capability to understand the relationship of these different sensors and how they sort of feed back with each other in various ways. So as I stated, one of the main reasons uh, that you've got these three inputs for the estimation of the air volume coming into the engine to match 
the needed fuel volume is so that they can sort of check on each other. And hopefully you saw in the previous example where a problem with the throttle position sensor would theoretically be detected by the PCM because of the consistency with the map and math readings that are both incongruent with the throttle position sensor reading. And what I think we may want to do here is let's um, actually test that. Let's go ahead and play around with this uh, engine and see if we can get a check engine light by causing a false signal with the throttle position sensor and see how the computer would detect it just for the fun of it. All right, so what I'm going to do for this crazy idea is go ahead and remove this throttle position sensor. And actually, uh, what I normally do before I remove these is I make a little paint mark. As I said earlier, sometimes these things have an adjustment on them, so this paint mark is going to allow me to make sure I get my adjustment uh, a little bit closer. So there's my throttle position sensor there. Um, what I've done is I've made a ground strap here for my throttle position sensor. So I can now move my potentiometer here and adjust the throttle position. And of course, this will be perceived by the PCM, but there actually is not throttle movement. All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, clear my check engine codes. Of course, I've got a couple of them because of unplugging the throttle position sensor earlier while it's on. So let me go ahead and clear those out. So when I go ahead and set this to wherever I want, that's going to make the computer think right now that the throttle is halfway open when it is not. And of course, there's going to be no changes to my manifold air pressure, uh, which will be very low because the engine will still be at vacuum, and also whatever my mass airflow sensor reading is. Um, obviously, it's zero now, but it will go up to about a, a pound and a half per minute or so. Uh, notice, by the way, I get pounds per minute and not grams per second rice burners. It's because of the massive displacement. So um, let's go ahead and start the engine up. And there should be no problems at idle. Uh, let me go ahead, first of all, and make sure I clear again any check engine codes that I may have got here. OK, we're all cleared. We see we've got no codes at all. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and start the car. The car should start perfectly normally without any problems because, of course, we are at idle position on our throttle position sensor. And we are at idle position, of course, with the throttle. And it's going to stay that way. All right, so let's go ahead and start the car. And again, I am going to severely recommend that you probably not do this kind of stuff at home. All right, so as we see, we have our normal readings. And by the way, it's tempting to put long and short-term fuel trim for some of you real experts out there. But remember, I'm starting the engine cold, and I also don't want there to be a fuel trim reading intentionally. I just want to see if we can get the check engine light from the map and MAF only. But obviously, if I increase the throttle position, the addition of fuel should cause the fuel trims to go rather rich. But uh, anyway, we're, we'll not do that today because I'm not interested in uh, fuel trim reading here. But uh, let's go ahead see if we can get this in frame. All right. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn. All right. We see we get an instant throttle reaction. See how the RPM is increasing even though we don't have a change in the actual amount of airflow. And that's, of course, because of the fuel addition. See, no change in the airflow or the map because the throttle is closed. But I can add more fuel because there's still the anticipation. Now, right now, the computer is probably thinking, what the hell? How come the throttle is opening, but there's no increase in airflow? So let's go ahead and see if we got a check engine light yet. Remember, if you saw my check engine light training video, you usually need to get two consecutive cycles of a failure to set a check engine light. But there may be a difference here. So let's go ahead and see if we got a uh, code thrown yet. And we do. There it is. P1122 throttle position sensor circuit. All right, now you see the difference between me and a kid driving a Honda Civic or a Acura Integra. When uh, they do stupid stuff to their car, they just look like idiots. When I do stupid stuff to my car, we all get smarter. But uh, what we are 
going to do is just quickly review exactly what we did just in case um, some of you didn't follow along. What I actually did was removed the throttle position sensor off of the throttle. So the other thing I did, of course, is the throttle position sensor needs to be touching something metal in the car, so I made a ground strap for it. And this allowed me to sort of remotely adjust the voltage to the PCM while maintaining the throttle position at idle no matter what I do. And so basically the amount of airflow coming in is going to be constant. There is no change to the airflow period, no matter what I do changing my throttle position sensor remotely here. So what I did then is as I rotated that little dial, that is sending higher voltage to the PCM. So the PCM thinks that the throttle has opened when it actually has not. The problem is the PCM is saying, what you talking about, Willis? Because the amount of airflow should have changed if the throttle opened, but it did not. The MAP sensor and the MAF read exactly the same, even though supposedly the throttle changed and should have let more air in. So how did the PCM react? Well, it threw a throttle position circuitry error code. It knew something was wrong with the throttle position sensor. Now, why didn't it throw a code for the MAF and the MAP? The reason is because both the MAF and the MAP are congruent in their readings on what's going on. So basically, they're outvoting that the throttle position sensor is obviously what's at fault. If we had done something where we messed with the circuitry of the MAP, for example, and we had actually increased airflow through the throttle. The throttle position sensor, of course, connected. We actually do literally increase airflow through the throttle in accordance with the voltage. The MAF picks it up, but we made it so the MAP couldn't detect it. Well, then we'd have these two being congruent and we would have got a MAP code. So you see how these are related and how in some instances it's possible you could get a referenced code based on the failure of another component or the perceived failure of another component. So it can get a little tricky. All right, so hopefully you guys learned something new. And once again, if you did learn something new, you learned it that's going to apply a lot uh, to a lot of things. And that's what we do on this here channel and will continue to do. So uh, thank you very much for watching. My name is Matt, and I hope you found this helpful.